with the passage of time, and humanity reaching an advanced stage of maturity, the works of sorcery became matters that no longer dazzle humans, or have the ability to control people as they did in the past. In the midst of this maturity experienced by the world, it would not be acceptable for someone who engages in such supernatural acts to become, in turn, supernatural, and deserving of a godlike status. Hence, ancient satanic beliefs have also become outdated methodologies that are difficult to convince. For Satan to regain control of the entire world to the place he desires, where he installs himself as a god, he had to execute another plan, with a strategy of immense proportions. To the extent that most people, even the majority who already believe in the existence of Satan, find it difficult to believe that such a plan could succeed. In ancient times, when God saved humanity for the first time from total destruction at the hands of the fallen watchers, and saved them again from the tyranny of the kingdoms of demons that almost possessed the world and enslaved humans. In those times, the earth was filled with plants and animals, and humans had dominion over them, and the sky above them was filled with celestial bodies that served humanity, by marking the days, months, and years and allowing travel across vast distances of the earth as well. Although most humans lived in pagan kingdoms that rejected the worship of God and worshiped the fallen ones, or demons, as gods, generally people still understood the basic nature of the world that God created for them, and knew where those gods came from. They knew they came from the stars, from the sky adorned with celestial bodies, or even from the highest heavens. And when the full truth of God was revealed through the person of Jesus Christ, the ancient cosmic knowledge was given its natural context. The distinction between the Creator and the creature was made clear and the futility of the rebellion brought by the demons was clarified. And for Satan to convince the world that he is the supreme being deserving of humanity's worship, he had to rewrite the entire text, and repackage himself and his kingdom and his message entirely in a new cover. Just like the old Shakespearean play was rewritten to fit into a new, modern attire suitable for the era, and suitable to be presented as a musical in modern Broadway theaters. To reintroduce the characters of the old play and rename them, you first need to readjust the settings and the designations, and the stage itself. Likewise, the devil found himself in need of a new dramatic backdrop, and a new window through which he could gradually insert himself, with his rebellious agenda against the Creator, into the hearts and minds of humans. Through a familiar tactic, he managed to create this new window. This tactic is the old trick of giving forbidden knowledge to humans to play on our pride and arrogance. And here it is being used again in a clever, deceitful, and cunning manner, but after renaming this forbidden and secret knowledge, known as Gnosticism, to a shiny new name, Science. Many foundations for rewriting the universe have already been laid. 
even before the birth of Jesus Christ, and in ancient Greece by what are called the Greek philosophers. These men were actually the ones who took many of the concepts and teachings that came from the schools of mystery, from spiritual intermediaries, and from the connection of pagan rituals with demonic worlds, then began to preserve them, adding their own speculations and conclusions centered around humanity and human nature. In this way, they purified these concepts from their demonic origins to appear in an acceptable form for subsequent generations, and an attractive image as mere deep thoughts and contemplations of ordinary men. During the Renaissance in Europe, many of these ideas began to take root again as they were considered harmonious with the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. And they slowly began to have a greater and greater influence on theologians and scientists throughout Christian Europe, especially after some works attributed to the Egyptian, Hermes Trismegistus, were translated into Latin and distributed among intellectuals who had a passion for such materials. The Kabbalah also began to receive more attention from philosophers, monks, and people who received literary education, alongside works on chemistry that came from Muslim Sufis as they claimed. Thus, these three sources of mysterious knowledge began to penetrate and spread. Do most students today realize that the majority of these respected men, who have been revered as pioneers and visionaries of material sciences, were greatly influenced by the concepts presented in mysterious secret manuscripts, along with some transmissions from the essence of Sufism and monasticism? Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Robert Flood, Nicholas Copernicus. These names and others we study and learn about in school as pioneers who made scientific discoveries and achievements through pure observation and logical inference. However, deeper and more comprehensive investigation into the issues they arrived at in their various discoveries, and the mysterious materials they all read by chance, reveals that no, these discoveries were nothing more than very ancient teachings about the universe and nature repackaged and presented in a Christian, or semi-Christian, guise. In the texts of the Kabbalah, one can find the Copernican cosmology, describing a vast universe and a planetary solar system. Even Kabbalistic texts long before Copernicus mentioned a massive explosion as the cause of everything's beginning. In addition to concepts of particles and chemical reactions, even the method of transmutation of elements through atomic fusion and fission was first introduced in the mysterious practices of alchemy. Thus, we discover that modern sciences are nothing but a version of ancient Gnostic texts modified to suit the modern age. The idea that nature and the universe are governed by unseen forces and laws that can be discovered, calculated, and then reapplied through various technological means this is actually a fundamental principle of Hermeticism. With reasonable assistance from wealthy secret societies such as the Rosicrucians and Freemasonry, the Royal Society was established as the first official organization dedicated to promoting scientific research, and the rest, as they say, is history.
What began as a lukewarm attempt to combine knowledge acquired from divine revelation with knowledge acquired from nature quickly turned into an unapologetic natural philosophy. And suddenly, the universe became very, very big, and God became very, very distant, to the point where it was easy to consider the universe itself capable of forming without God's assistance at all. Copernican models of the heavens expanded, and refined. And Darwin entered to explain how life could appear by chance from the primordial soup after a long period of the slow formation of the earth over billions of years, from the slow aggregation of cosmic dust in the void of space. Universities and lecture halls became exclusive megaphones for the satanic elite. As they were built and developed almost exclusively by the same wealthy bloodline societies, it is not surprising that they become hostile territory for anyone daring to question the flourishing new scientific consensus or oppose the model imposed on humans, which presented the universe as a vast, evolving, and limitless space, while our little blue planet floats somewhere in the middle. And although man is the pinnacle of life on this planet, and sits atop the pyramid of life's hierarchy on Earth, he may not be alone in the universe. Thus, the stage was set, and the old characters themselves began to gradually reappear in a new set of costumes, until we reached the greatest scientific hoax known to humanity. In the 20th century, Many events occurred compared to the preceding centuries, making it difficult to summarize these events that changed the shape of the world. The beginning of the century witnessed a new cosmological model, or rather an old one reintroduced, adopted and appropriately placed at least in the halls of academia. This model provides a new theory that appears convincing but is deceptive, paving the way for a new wave of rebellious observer armies or fallen entities to descend to Earth and present themselves as extraterrestrial beings. We must pause here and deeply consider the issue of the dimensional veil, the barrier that seems to have been placed by the Creator after the invasion of the observers before the Flood. Can fallen angels, or demons, reveal themselves again to humanity, but this time as alien saviors, and become rulers of the earthly satanic kingdom? Perhaps. Can demonic spirits manifest and materialize in the material world, inhabit people, move objects, and even assault individuals? Yes, but not now. Although the ability of the satanic kingdom to interact with our material world remains limited, this limitation will not last long. For the Bible confirms that this barrier will remain in place until the end. In the future, it will be removed, and the one-eyed Antichrist will have an unprecedented period of arrival on Earth and humanity for the last time, before meeting his inevitable end after the return of Jesus. While I certainly do not claim to have all the answers or have a perfect understanding of Torah eschatology or end-time prophecy, one thing I have repeatedly returned to through research over the past few years in cosmology, prophecies, ongoing events, and the rise of scientists and their roots in the secret world. That thing is quantum physics. It seems to play somehow a significant role in the ancient grand satanic agenda, referred to by the Bible as the Great Deception. In the 19th and 20th centuries, atoms became an official modern theory, leading us to our present day, filled with ideas and terms like string theory, dark matter, and large hadron collider collisions.
The atom has been split with a terrifying destructive force or the potential for energy production. And it has undoubtedly been proven, the existence of this extremely vast quantum reality, which cannot be denied. Or can it? Do the origins of these deep, mysterious theories seem as if they are permeated with magic, any remaining significance for us today? Is there still a spiritual agenda yet to be unveiled behind all these hidden connections behind all these coincidences? Modern astrologer Manley P. Hall believes that there is a significant subconscious importance to atoms and has delivered numerous lectures on this subject. Today, we increasingly hear theoretical physicists and other materialist scientists speaking of a strange resemblance between things claimed to be discovered in modern quantum physics and things found in the teachings of Kabbalah and other ancient hermetic forms. Through the history of atoms, we can see this familiar trend of original Sufi philosophy gradually flowing, and with difficulty, towards what is supposed to be a purely material and scientific cognitive base, which ironically ends up where it began, directing humanity once again towards the ancient hermetic belief system. Has humanity been deceived to such an extent that they are building machines that will serve as a key to releasing an army of hostile entities imprisoned in their distant prison? Have demons begun to entrench those false astronomical and physical doctrines long ago, so that in the end we believe we were gaining knowledge to achieve our own eternity, when in reality we were just playing God's role? And even today, the process of discovery continues. And through the teachings of Kabbalah and Zohar, we can clearly see that there is nothing called death. This is a very important teaching for them. For example, you're driving your car and you see a small animal, but it gets run over and killed on the road. It's a sad tragedy. But in the true lessons of Kabbalah, we find that this animal is made up of atoms these atoms are described in Kabbalistic texts as small points of light. And that is how the atom was described. They are particles you can't see with the naked eye, but they are the building blocks of the entire universe, and the foundation of its construction, and everything in it. As for this small dead creature, it is made up of atoms, and those atoms are full of energy and energy does not perish or die. So, traditional Kabbalistic texts divide things and describe them according to particle theory. What's truly interesting is that the oral traditions of Kabbalistic teachings are passed down from father to son and from mother to daughter. And there is a version of nuclear physics, which was strongly present in Central and Eastern Europe. Well, where did nuclear physicists come from? Niels Bohr, Isidore Isaac Rabi, the Oppenheimer brothers, Edward Teller, who invented the hydrogen bomb, and others? If you were to research their family histories, you would discover that they all came from Central and Eastern Europe which is the geographic area where the oral traditions of Kabbalah were at their peak. The book, The Real Dr. Strange Love, explains that Kabbalah is now being written into quantum theory, with quarks and neutrons, and all these strange particles that travel at speeds approaching the speed of light. These are the mysterious particles that have been discovered in molecular particle accelerators. And if you know about Kabbalah as people like Albert Einstein and Edward Teller seemingly did, you would surely see how scientists always make quantum physics fit in with Kabbalah. Strange, isn't it? But what's coming next is even stranger. <laughs>